Uh, you know, in light of all of the spiritual abuse that's mm-hmm. happening uh, within the church, we're just hearing stories after stories after stories of these high profile guys. And, you know, and we, we know it because they're high profile. But what about other, you know, smaller churches where a lot of spiritual abuse goes on, where pastors kind of overstep their bounds as you know into speaking to people's lives and controlling and so we just wanted to talk a little bit about like what what is spiritual authority what you know what does that mean regarding pastors who pastor churches leadership you know that relationship between pastor and the congregation and 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 where the limits and and overstepping and and all those kind of things What, what is that idea of spiritual authority Hey, welcome to Whitefields Community Church Sermon Extra. Great to have you with us once again this week. I'm here with Pastor Nick Katie. He's the pastor of Whitefields Community Church here in Longmont, Colorado. And uh, we are in our series called Strength and Weakness. And we are in chapter two of 2 Corinthians, Paul's second letter that he wrote that we have recorded for us. And we're looking at uh, verses 12 through 17 and our message is entitled Triumph in the Trials. And so if you missed any of that uh please, whitefieldschurch.com, get over there. You can download uh, from directly from the website or YouTube, Facebook, or any of your favorite podcast platforms. You will find the sermons there. And if you would, you know, if you're watching or you're listening, just give us a thumbs up, rate and review. This certainly helps to just raise everything up in the, you know, the the algorithms of cyberspace so that uh, when people are asking questions about these things, when they're in the midst of trials or these kind of things, you know, we can provide them with Christ-centered and gospel-centered um, answers to their questions. So today, uh, just a question that kind of kind of comes from this, this passage, kind of revolves around the idea of how can I know God's will for my life? And, you know, Paul has kind of been that guy that's sometimes put forward as like the example sometimes of knowing God's will for my, your life or being obedient to the Spirit. But as you study Paul, Paul's life and specifically here you see that he's kind of like if you're going to build a theology of what is God's will for my life he seems to be kind of all over the place and right here we have an example of that where it says a door is open for me in the Lord going to Troas of course but my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there Titus there and if we go back to like Acts chapter 20 uh, we see there twice he's prophesied the, the 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 saints there in Tyre and then in Caesarea they say hey you know you shouldn't go the spirit he's like basically saying the spirit says don't go to Jerusalem and of course then Paul goes to Jerusalem and then of course I think we were talking about Acts 16 where it says Paul says the spirit forbade me to go to Macedonia and then he ended up going to Phrygia instead or something like that so we just kind of want to talk about this idea of knowing God's will for my life like is it some kind of cosmic secret that that God's kind of keeping for us that we need to kind of you know search under every rock and make sure that we're at the right place at the right time or what happens as you talked about on Sunday what happens if we turn right when we're supposed to turn left you know but yet our motives and everything were in the right place but like we're like oh well what what's going to happen now or you know God forbid we married the wrong person you know like of course, that could send up a chain of events. If you marry the wrong person, then somebody else is definitely going to marry the wrong person. Now you just screwed up the entire universe. So how do we deal with with some of this this question, you know, uh, of, you know, what is God's will for my life and how can I find out what my next steps in life are? Maybe that is what's wrong with the universe. One guy <laughs> married the wrong person or girl married the wrong person. And then that meant that everybody else married the wrong person. And then that's where we are where we are. That's probably not the case. Hey, by the way, what's all that noise in the background, Mike? Well, exciting things are happening around here at Whitefields Community Church. Here we're under construction. We are in the middle of our renovation. Uh, We're turning our sanctuary space from 235 to 460 or so. Uh, to just accommodate all that the Lord is doing here. And so any of that banging and crashing and all that noise and people talking is just going to be happening during this time since we can't really relocate. So that's what you're going to hear and just enjoy. Just things are happening and moving and we're just going with it. I'm excited. (laughs) I like walking through there, seeing what they did every day because it's changing a lot every day. So, all right, God's will. Here's the deal. Uh, Some people would just say, 
well, if you want to know God's will, just read the Bible. Well, they're right, and they're also not right, because here's why. Um, so there is what we would call the general will of God, right? So God's will for every person. Um, that is certainly found in the Bible, without question. But on the other hand, like, okay, is it God's will for me to... Um, is it God's will for me to go to Bithynia, right? That, that would be specific to Paul, right? He's looking for direction, not just God, what should I do in general? He knows the general thing. He's been sent out on a mission by Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations. The question is, what does that look like in his life personally? So this is where we would differentiate between the general will of God and the personal will of God. And, and this is uh, an important question. I think this is one that, that a lot of people want to know. On the one hand, I would tell you this. What Paul says there in chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, verse uh, 14, where he says that God leads us in Christ in triumph at all times, that's super important because what it means is, look, if you're walking in the general will of God, right, these broad strokes that are true uh, as principles for all people at all times, then let's say you did... Uh, you know, make a mistake in following the specific door that God opened for you to walk through. I think what, he, what he's saying there is really important because it means that if you turn left rather than turning right, you're going to walk in triumph going left, right? It's as you've said before in uh, the book of Proverbs, right? Delight yourself in the Lord. He will guide your path. And so, so there's that. But I think there are a few ways to, to think through this idea of knowing God's personal will for my life. Um, I think that, yeah, on the one hand, God places desires in your heart. On the other hand, God will lead you uh, in many ways, gifts of the Spirit, right? We see in Acts 13, they were, they were um, praising the Lord. They were blessing the Lord, it says, together. And there were some there who had the gift of prophecy. And somehow, and we're not even told how, we're not told whether there's a word of prophecy, whether it was an inner um, nudge, if you will, that one of them had. But together, collectively, the group realized that what the Holy Spirit was saying was to lay hands on Paul and Barnabas and send them out as missionaries. And so, um, so that's part of it. Being in community, it's those gifts of the Holy Spirit that are at work as you're seeking the Lord. And then um, it seems that there were also circumstantial things going on in Paul's life. You know, so you mentioned Acts 16. The, the, what it says there is he had passed through the regions of Phrygia and Galatia, and he wanted to go to Asia, but he was not allowed. And then it says, okay, then he didn't do that, so he went up to this other place, and he wanted to go into Mysia. And there it says that the Holy Spirit forbade him from going. And so what does that mean? Well, there's a lot of thoughts. Some people think it's just an inner sense that Paul had that the Holy Spirit is saying, no, don't do it. Other people would point to, you know, perhaps this is what Paul's referring to at the end of his letter to the Galatians, where he says, you Galatians, you would have even given me your own eyes. Well, why did he say that? That's kind of a weird thing to say. Well, probably because Paul had a problem with his eyes. And, uh, and so some people say, well, maybe that is the reason why he couldn't go to Asia. Maybe it was political turmoil. Maybe the roads were blocked. Maybe it was uh, in his own life there was some kind of circumstance that didn't allow him to go there. Whatever the reason was, it was, uh, a lot of people say, was it circumstantial? Was it personal? I don't know. But we do know, we do see guidance through sometimes circumstantial things, through sometimes uh, gifts of the Spirit. And, uh, and then Paul says this interesting one here in uh, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14, about having peace in his spirit. Now, personally, my take on this in context is that what Paul's describing, that's a cool noise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't have a filter for that. Yeah, so what Paul's <laughs> describing there is, um, you know, almost saying that he left a opportunity on the table that God had given him, given him a great opportunity, an open door. The only other places where he uses that word open door, 1 Corinthians 16, he describes his ministry in Ephesus as being a great open door. And his ministry in Ephesus was the most effective ministry. It didn't just reach that city, it reached the whole region and, uh, and things like that. So, so clearly this was a big opportunity and Paul let it go. Was it good that he let it go or was it not? Well, clearly some people would have criticized it as being bad. Now, sometimes you hear people talk about having a peace about something. I think I would caution people about being uh, 
trusting too much in that kind of inner sense of peace because as we read in the Bible, in Jeremiah, our hearts are deceitful. Our hearts lie to us. They don't always tell us the truth, right? And the heart meaning the sense of emotion, the sense of person and being. And so let's say, uh, I mean, we were just talking about this a minute ago. We have personally, I know I have personally talked to people who are doing things which were clearly outside the bounds of what the Bible says is right and wrong. And they would say, it's okay. I have a peace about it, right? Living in an adulterous relationship and saying, no, 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 it's okay. God's given me a peace about mm -hmm. it. I say, I, I don't care if you have a peace about it. That's not how this works, right? Like God doesn't uh, say, you know, here's what my word says. And then, okay, but I'm going to give John over here. His name wasn't John, by the way. <laughs> but I'm going to give John over here a piece about this because, you know, he gets a pass to do whatever he wants. Or we talk about like people who um, l abandon their spouse and they say, it's okay. Uh, I have a piece about it. Oh, okay. Well, that solves it all, right? No, that's not how this peace thing works. Mm. Um, it is good to have to feel settled in something, to feel that the Holy Spirit's given you the go ahead. But I'll tell you what: in every big thing I've ever done, where I've stepped out in faith, there's been some sense, and I think this is actually the essence of faith. There's been some sense that I think this is the right thing to do. I've prayed about it. I've asked God to, you know, circumstantially close those mm -hmm. doors or just make it clear through other people, like, I should not do this. And even, um, even when we're doing I, I remember, like, when we moved into this building, um, there was part of me was like, okay, I really believe this is the right thing to do. And yet there was that, still that question mark in my mind. Like when we read the contract. Yeah, or when we had to pay the bill. bill. And then when we had a pandemic and still had to yeah, pay yeah, the bill. Yeah. And it was like, I don't really have a piece right now, <laughs> but I'm going to yeah. walk forward in faith because faith means, yeah, moving forward, trusting God in spite of my weakness, even if that weakness is that I don't have peace about doing something, even though it's what God's calling me to do. I mean, that's the essence of courage, right? Doing something even when you're scared. So um, I don't think that we should make too much of that thing of like the inner sense of peace. Um, so, so that's my take on all of it. I do think it is a difficult thing to nail down, right? It's like trying to nail jello to the wall. It, every time you do, it moves on you. Mm -hmm. um, I think, though, that that is really part of the essence of walking with God, that God's a person, right? He's not a formula. Mm -hmm. It's not somewhere you can turn to page 302 and find the exact formula for how everything works. I think that God gives us um, many times principles and instructions, mm -hmm. and then he says, see me for the details. And so it requires personal relationship with him. And you know what? Sometimes we are going to get it wrong, but that's why that mm -hmm. verse is so important, because no matter what, he's leading us in triumph at all times, as long as we are in Christ. Yeah, no, I think that's very good. And I mean, I think just to sum up, just to kind of from what you were saying, I can hear, you know, communion with God and then communion with your community. Mm -hmm. You know, those are two very important aspects. And then being, you know, led by the gospel. And in, in doing that, it's very difficult to go wrong when you have all of those things yeah. in play. When you're in communion with God, you're in community with your church, you know, because so much of how God speaks to us is in our own community, in those people that we've trusted and, you know, and, and we pray with, and God speaks through them. And, and we need those people who are saying, you know what, Nick, that's not you, or that's not God, that's just you, mm -hmm. right? That's... I can see you, right? Like I can see through what you're saying. We need that. We need people who push back on us and say, hey, are you sure it's really the Holy Spirit? Are you sure that's not just your own personal thing? We need that. And maybe maybe they're wrong. Mm -hmm. I've had that before too, where people, I felt God was leading in a certain way and somebody came up and said, well, I don't think so. And, you know, you pray through that. But even just the tension of the pushback, right? The, the conversation mm -hmm drives you to seek the Lord all the more. More, yeah. No, that's that's very, very important. And so that's just, I guess, on that particular question, I think that's just a great place to start. I, as you said, this is a vast topic, and, you know, there's just, you know, a lot more that we can get into. We do want to talk about one other thing today um, before we go, and that's kind of an overarching theme uh, that is in this book, and that is spiritual authority. I've touched on it. You've touched on it. I think Jason also kind of talked about it when his message is kind of one of the main topics that, that Paul finally addresses, you know, in detail within this particular letter, which is kind of more very biographical, very personal letter where Paul just kind of lays himself out there and says, guys, this is who I am. 
and and that's the idea of, of spiritual authority and of course within this particular letter his spiritual authority is challenged so we just wanted to cover that topic uh, you know in light of all of the spiritual abuse that's mm-hmm. happening uh, within the church we're just hearing stories after stories after stories of these high profile guys and you know and we we know it because they're high profile but what about other you know smaller churches where a lot of spiritual abuse goes on where pastors kind of overstep their bounds as you know into speaking to people's lives and controlling and so we just wanted to talk a little bit about like what what is spiritual authority what you know what does that mean regarding pastors who pastor churches leadership you know that relationship between pastor and the congregation and 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 where are the limits and and overstepping and and all those kind of things what what is that idea of spiritual authority yeah well clearly paul is saying that he he's kind of pulling rank in in part of this letter and he even says he's like i'm like embarrassed to even do this but i have to he's pulling rank i mean you think about it even with with kids or in a work situation anytime a leader has to pull rank that means that things have gotten pretty out of control right and so it doesn't mean it's never wrong to pull rank but um it's not it means that things have gotten pretty bad so uh, he, he is doing that. He's saying, hey, I'm an apostle by the will of Christ Jesus. Um, and you, you who challenge me, here's my rebuttal to that. And yeah, wh- why does he even have to do this? Well, it's because they're challenging it. But what is spiritual authority? I mean, clearly God has given certain people to be in roles of leadership. Now, true leadership, Paul says this in chapter one of, of 2 Corinthians. He says, look, what it means this spiritual authority I have, it isn't for me to lord over you. The purpose of this spiritual authority is for me to be a helper of your joy. And uh, I think that's a really big distinction. Jesus talks about that with his disciples. He said, here's what true leadership is. True leadership is serving. He goes, I'm obviously the greatest leader in the world, Jesus says, and I am the greatest servant so much that I give my life. And that is what true spiritual leadership is. If you don't have that, you don't have authority. And that's the purpose of authority. Authority is never to be used for selfish gain, but for the good of the, of the individual you're working with or serving. And I would say that is when, when somebody becomes abusive, when somebody begins using their, their position of authority for their own personal gain, not for the benefit of the person that they exist to serve and to lead. Yeah, and I think, and Paul brings that that phrase, which is, you know, for me, it's always stuck in, in my mind, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And and that's that's kind of a mandate that we have as pastors and leaders in a church, though it is very difficult, is that imitate me as I imitate Christ. As people as people look to us, we we need to set an example as we step on a stage that God has given us a platform that gives us certain responsibilities to be the people that God's called us to be. It's not, you know, I'm don't 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 look at me, look at Jesus kind of thing. It's like look at me as I follow Jesus in my frailty and in my triumph, and in my forgiveness, and my humbleness, and in my success, you know, and all those kind of things. And we see that, I, you know, when you talk about we work with you for your joy, there's that idea of, of community working with the people we are, not lording over, you know. And uh, so what would you say, like, w- when is a, a pastor overstepping his bounds in the, in the idea in the realm of spiritual authority? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that when they're overstepping their bounds is when they're trying to control things that are not their job to control. Like, for example, I've seen people, uh, it's almost like what we would call a power trip, right? Like where you're trying to tell people what to do uh, in the details of their life as opposed to just giving them godly biblical counsel. And I would say, yeah, if you're, if you're getting to the point of taking advantage of somebody, um, for your own personal gain, I mean, that's clearly abusive. If you're making people do things that are crossing ethical, moral, biblical lines, that is way out of bounds. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's a really important thing, that we're called to be above reproach. And those who lead, and it mentions those who teach, but obviously those yeah. roles are tied together, um, they're going to be held to a higher standard. And... Um, I think that that's what we need to keep in mind. Uh, again, it never has; it can never be for personal gain. It must always be 
you know, for the good of that person. And it can't overstep any biblical lines. And I think that that also includes uh, ethical lines. Sometimes to figure out what the ethical thing is, you have to deduce, right? You read between the lines, in other words. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are things which may not be said uh, specifically in the Bible, but there's an ethical uh, framework that's given. And when you're acting in a way that's unethical, that's selfish, that's uh, unbiblical or immoral. Those are all way out of bounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, those are some great thoughts. Well, I mean, this is a subject that we're probably covering some more since this is kind of one of those arcing themes that we will find. Uh, Paul's integrity, you know, the spiritual authority and these kind of things are overarching themes in this particular letter. So we're going to be diving into this some more. You know, if you have any questions or, you know, thoughts surrounding this particular topic, you know, maybe you've been somebody who's been the subject of spiritual abuse, you know, let us, let us know, you know, we'd like to have a conversation with you and speak into that if we can. And uh, we just uh, look forward to seeing you once again, again, Whitefields Community Church. Uh, subscribe, like, do all that kind of fun stuff. And we look forward to seeing you again. God bless.